ahora nos encontramos en Medellín, en Fractal 2010, uh -huh. con la compañía de Dark Gregory. Uh, y un amigo está haciendo una video una entrevista. Okay, so my question will be like, why, why the obsession of Philip K. Dick with madness, with the schizoids, paranoids? There are constant characters that are even or either paranoid, schizoids. Is, is madness part of Dick's obsession with reality? Well, definitely, because he was feeling paranoid. He was feeling depressed. He would sometimes have to go to bed for you know days at a time. Um, he was um, and. He, he uh, was committed into a psychiatric hospital a couple times in his life. Um, so this was definitely something that was coming out of his own life and that he kept coming back to in his fiction. But it's interesting to me is that his fiction, he started thinking about, writing about this stuff before his problems got really bad. So it seems like early on there was, a, there was this obsession and then it's almost like his life followed this, the, the story of his books because his life got stranger and stranger and his books got stranger and stranger. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I was maybe going in this direction. There's like some kind of quote by Philip K. Dick that says something like, "Reality is that on which keeps existing even when you ignore it." Or something. Yeah, yeah. Reality, reality. Yeah, reality is that which, when you stop believing in it, yeah, exactly. yeah it still exists. Um, that's the crazy thing. He said that quote, and it's a really famous quote. Um, but the point of most of his books is that uh, reality, true reality, is this thing over here. The thing that you believe in at first is probably the false reality. So a lot of times in his books, he didn't have um, he didn't have you know one world and an alternate world. A lot of times he had. Uh, the false world that everyone is living in and believes in, and then the true world sort of pokes through, yeah. and you and you begin to perceive that there's an underlying reality. Um, so that really it deletes my my two questions because I was actually thinking that his view of reality was actually going for some kind of subjective reality, some kind of call for solipsism. But you, you're actually saying that there's actually an objective reality that, I don't know, that is there. Yeah, it's, it's like, um, uh, some of his novels are like uh, uh, Plato's idea. If you've ever read any Plato, The Shadows on the Wall uh, parable about how humans um, there's light coming past us and we see the shadows on the wall, but we don't see the real objects that yeah. cast those shadows. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so his belief was that we're seeing shadows that are being distorted, but there actually is a real true world out there that if we could only break through, if we could only become sane enough, um, that we would see what the true reality was. Okay, yeah. um, so, and some of his books are um, Gnostic. So the, the Gnostic, um, there's a bunch of Gospels early, um, early on in the early parts of um, the first century that were written by Christians who had divergent beliefs that what, from what became regular Christianity. Um, so the Gnostics believe that um, that Jesus only gave you part of the knowledge that people were that the public could understand, yeah. but that there were secret messages being passed on to the disciples and yeah. to other people. And if you could just um, study longer, you could find out the true knowledge. And then there were some other beliefs that that saying that that. Yahweh of the Old Testament, Jehovah, um, is this angry kind of insane God, yeah. and that there's another twin God who's really the good, the good God, and people are worshiping the wrong God, and there's a true, real God out there okay. if we could just break through. It gets very complicated, and he would change his mind through his life about what he believed. Yeah. Um, at, but he kept coming back to he was, um, to Christian theology. He was definitely a Christian, but he kept trying to explain things in terms of God and, and Christ and um, and what what were they really doing in the world. So he wasn't. Um, he would read about Buddhism and Hinduism, uh, but he kept coming back to his fundamental uh, way of thinking about the world was was Christian. Okay. Yeah, that that, that probably <laughs> answers my question. Yeah, okay. yeah. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah, very sure. Please. Uh, yeah. I want you to ask uh, which uh, author do you think has 
like uh, a suspension capsules uh, speed for Philip Kirik? Um, I mean, certainly Jonathan Latham has studied Dick a lot and is a, is, is, a, is a Philip K. Dick scholar, and some of his books are very, very Dickian. Um, but there's also um, writers like J.D. Ballard, who is writing around the same time as Philip K. Dick, who seems, ve- I mean, they seem very much in sync. Um, and as far as new writers, um, um, I'm trying to think of who... who for, for me, I, uh, from the very few writers I have read, uh, there's uh, a novel by Rucker. Oh, yeah, Rudy Rucker. Right, right, yeah. yeah. And, um, the one about the robots in the moon who comes to Earth to Earth. Um, uh, yeah, oh, um, that's the, the software and software, wetware? Yeah, yeah, software, wetware, Whoa. yeah. Yeah, those are, those are great books. Um, yeah, he he's an interesting case because he he does reality distortion. He distorts reality, um, but using um, technology like computation and quantum mechanics. And so, while Philip K. Dick believed there was almost a spiritual shift to reality, Rudy Rucker explains how it could work with technology and how um, even. Um, Augmented reality can sort of come along through um, through the use of uh, massive amounts of computation on computers. From your books, which one do you think is the uh, most Dickian? Oh, from my books? Yeah. Oh, definitely uh, Pandemonium, my first book. Um, it was it was kind of an homage to Philip K. Dick. And not only did I put him in as a character, um, but but uh, um, it's a it's a Phil Dick, uh, uh, a Phil Dickian kind of hero, and that he's kind of a loser. He's um, I'm not sure what that, that word would be in Spanish, but he's not the typical hero. He's he's yeah, yeah. Um, he's, he's a guy who's had a lot more trouble, really, more problems than um, than heroic qualities. And um, he also has a rea- you know he has a identity crisis in the book. Um, he doesn't know whether he's an authentic person or not. So all of these things came about from me reading a lot of Philip K. Dick, and, and it, uh, I'm, I'm using a lot of his themes. Is there uh, any translation of your book to Spanish? Spanish? No, I wish there was. Um, uh, there, I think the closest I've gotten to another romantic language is Italian. <laughs> so, so that doesn't really help. Um, so it's it's been translated in a couple different languages, uh, Russian and Czech and Italian, uh, but it has not made. Um, and maybe you can help me do that. Find some publisher who will who will publish it. I, I got a friend from Argentina. He is a a, a very little publisher. I think I can. Okay. I mean, that's okay. My um, the the person who's publishing a translation in Israel is a very small publisher. Um, uh, so it, I think, especially with translation, it, it, the size of the publishing company doesn't matter. I mean, the hard part about it is just doing all that. That it's a very hard process to translate an yeah. entire novel and to do it well. And especially, Pandemonium has a lot of very American slang, uh, a lot of American cultural references, which most of the world knows through TV and stuff, but there's some references that I, I don't think will translate well, but that's what good translators do. Okay. Gracias. Gracias. Oh, thank you. You have to send me a link. I would love to see it.